Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to class eight. Today we'll be talking about uh, Alistair, Alistair McIntyre's After Virtue and GEM Anscombe's uh, Chastity and Contra Contraception and Chastity uh, with the goal of thinking about the, another way in which conservative traditionalism has emerged and with this idea of virtue ethics and this emphasis on communities of meaning that we get with McIntyre. And I'm going to start today's lecture uh, with the way that McIntyre starts after virtue with this fable that he imagines uh, borrowed heavily from the book by Walter Miller, uh, A Canticle for Leibowitz. And in both this novel and in McIntyre's uh, fable, the world has more or less undergone a series of apocalyptic catastrophes, uh, economic collapse, environmental destruction, war, uh, and that the basically the human population at that time has basically decided that the enemy the cause of all this suffering was scientific knowledge and expertise. And so all forms of knowledge and expertise became vilified and outlawed. Scientific books and articles were burnt, laboratories were destroyed, scientists, engineers, academics were executed, all because knowledge was viewed as the enemy of, of humanity and too dangerous to let live. Um, however, in both the novel and as McIntyre writes on, on page one here, uh, later still, there was a reaction against this destructive movement and enlightened people sought to, to revive science, although they have largely forgotten what it was. But all they possess are fragments, a knowledge of experiments to detach from any knowledge of the theoretical context which gave them significance, uh, plans of theories unrelated either to, to either other bits and pieces of theory which they possess or to experiment, instruments whose use has been forgotten, half chapters from books, single pages from articles, not always fully legible because torn and charred. Now, in, in Miller's novel, uh, these fragments come to form the basis of a new religion as monks repeatedly transcribe, preserve, and illuminate. That is, uh, as you can see on this, this kind of example, they uh, write, they kind of retranscribe these mm -hmm. texts in uh, beautiful calligraphy with detailed illustrations and gold and embossments. These, uh, and they do that through these scraps and fragments um, as, a kind, as, as you would with religious texts. But because they lack the underlying scientific theories for which these fragments uh, came from, they're unable to make use of them. So they have this, this, this outline of a circuit uh, within Miller's novel, but they have no idea what any of these things mean. But they know that they're important forms of knowledge from the previous uh, like golden age of humanity. So they continue trying to study them and trying to piece them together, but are unable to kind of make any headway. Uh, McIntyre writes, in such a culture, uh, men would continue to use expressions such as neutrino, mass, specific gravity, atomic weight, in systematic and often interrelated ways, which would resemble in lesser or greater disease, uh, sorry, degrees the ways in which such expressions uh, ha have uh, been used in earlier times before scientific knowledge had been so largely lost. But many of the beliefs presupposed by the use of these expressions would have been a loss and there would appear an element of arbitrariness in um, in their, their uh, sorry, arbitrariness and every choice of their applications would appear very surprising to us. Um, McIntyre warns, like in Miller's novel, that even though uh, they seem to be conforming to scientific norms, they aren't really doing science. Uh, these people lack the background context, which gives meanings to these words. Um, there's no underlying account of the basic science that makes it, that makes that, that you could evaluate the, the competing rival claims. Uh, and so rival theories are basically just two, the two scientists yelling at each other with no way to actually evaluate which theory is correct. Uh, and so the ordinary language of science becomes fairly meaningless and, and it, you, you, there's no scientific progress. Uh, we're locked in a dark age, despite having these fragments from the previous golden age. Now for McIntyre, the purpose of this fable is to uh, is to that while this world may be hypothetical with respect to the natural sciences, uh, he thinks that it's an accurate way of understanding morality. He writes on page two that the hypothesis which with I wish to advance is that in the actual world in which we inhabit, the language of morality is in the same state of grave disorder as the language of natural sciences in the imaginary world I've described. What we possess in this view, if this view is true, are fragments of a conceptual scheme, plans which, uh, which now lack those contexts from which their significance derived. We possess indeed simulacra of morality. We continue to use so many of the key expressions, but we have largely, if not entirely, lost their comprehension, both theoretical and practical or morality. That is, we've lost the original contexts and frameworks that gave meaning to our moral language, but we still continue to use terms like good, bad, just, unjust, virtue, vice, 
um, in our ordinary political and moral discourse, but because these are just kind of scraps, according to McIntyre, from a tradition that we've systematically destroyed, um, we just use this language of good and bad, moral, immoral, to dress up our subjective preferences. Um, this is what he later in the book calls emotivism. Uh, we use the language of justice or morality in politics, but we're simply using these terms uh, to justify our pre-existing beliefs without any sort of anchor or any sort of like authority that could allow us to evaluate what justice actually means. And so for McIntyre, we have moral debates such as those over reproductive justice, racial justice, queer rights that seem irresolvable. Uh, and there's no arguments that either side can give to be, that can be persuasive to the other. And this is because we've lost the unifying reference to our moral vocabulary. As he writes on page eight of the book, which was not assigned, it's precisely because there is in our society no established way of deciding between these claims that moral argument appears to be necessarily interminable. From our rival conclusions, we argue back to our rival premises, but when we do arrive at our premises, argument ceases and the invocation of one premise against another becomes a matter of pure assertion and counter assertion. Hence, perhaps the slightly shrill term of much moral debate. And so McIntyre's project and Anscombe's project as well, we'll talk about G.E. and Anscombe as well, is to identify the original context of our moral language and the cause of that elimination uh, in, that gave it meaning. Unsurprisingly, given our course themes uh, so far, he identifies the enlightenment as the cause of the elimination of the tradition that gives meaning to our moral language. Um, arguing that the modern self has lost the traditional boundaries provided by a social identity and a view of human life is ordered to a given end. Uh, so uh, what gives moral language for McIntyre meaning is belonging to a tradition that shares a conception of the good life for human beings, something that the Enlightenment project of individual freedom and autonomy and equality destroys. And so the question for both McIntyre and Anscombe is, can a conception of virtue and natural law uh, be revived, or is our moral argumentation completely incomprehensible? So I'm going to go through this argument in a little bit more detail, uh, the failure of the Enlightenment project, um, and then look at the, uh, McIntyre's attempt to recover a, a tradition of virtue, and then looking at McIntyre's and uh, argument as well as Anscombe's discussion of contraception to think about how we, what are some of the political implications of this framework. So a quick note on context. Uh, here, uh, um, Alistair McIntyre is, is, sorry, he's still alive, uh, a, a Scottish philosopher who's held posts throughout the United States, including Duke, Brandeis, Vanderbilt, Notre Dame. Uh, and he has advocated in what he calls an Aristotelian Thomistic, Thomistic after Thomas Aquinas, uh, the Catholic theologian in the Middle Ages, approach to ethics. Uh, he, his goal is basically to revive an Aristotelian account of virtues in which human the goal of human life is to perform virtuous action, and he thinks that uh, Thomas Aquinas's development of Aristotle's philosophy in to make it compatible with Christianity was more or less right. He said he he's told said in interviews that he converted to Catholicism in his fifties, uh, basically he, when he was unable to refute uh, Aquinas's arguments. Uh, after virtue is his most important contribution to philosophy, and we'll talk about it. Uh, but other works, including 1988's Whose Justice, Which Rationality, continues the argument of after virtue to explore rival traditions of ethics, and his 2001 book, uh, Dependent Rational Animals, attempts to ground this argument for virtue ethics in the nature of human beings as biological creatures. Uh, McIntyre is most well known in political theory as a part of the communitarian critique of liberalism, uh, associated with people like Charles Taylor, Michael Sandel, and Michael Walzer. Um, and this was a form of argument in political theory that was popular in the 80s and 90s as a response to uh, John Rawls's revival of liberalism in a theory of justice. Uh, and the communitarians argued that liberal individualism uh, had an inadequately social conception of a person, that it was too atomistic, too isolated, too individualistic, uh, that human beings aren't just social creatures, but that human flourishing and the good life is only possible within thick contextual communities, which Rawls's liberalism and its thought experiment at the veil of ignorance de denied. Uh, Gertrude Elizabeth Margaret Anscombe, um, who, we, who is also a key figure in the revival of natural law and virtue ethics and philosophy, was born in Ireland to British parents in 1919, uh, as her father was stationed in Ireland as part of the Welsh army during the Irish War for Independence. 
Uh, in high school, she converted to Catholicism before attending uh, uh, a uh, university at uh, Oxford and, and, and graduate school at Cambridge. Um, she studied, she went to Cambridge for as a graduate student to study uh, Wittgenstein's lectures on philosophy and continued to work as Wittgenstein's pupil uh, and earned a research fellowship at Somerset College, Oxford, and then a lectureship at Cambridge. Uh, while an undergraduate, she publicly opposed Britain entering World War II, and while a research fellow at Oxford, uh, she opposed the university granting President Truman an honorary degree, calling him a mass murderer for using nuclear weapons. So she was not afraid to kind of uh, get involved in, controver in controversial political questions. Uh, she famously debated uh, C.S. Lewis at Oxford, um, the Christian apologist and children's fantasy author. Uh, their debate was over the nature of miracles, and her argument was so compelling that it forced him to rewrite a chapter of his book on miracles for, uh, when it was republished. Um, she's most well known in philosophy as her translator of Wittgenstein's uh, works on the philosophy of language from German into English. And Wittgenstein actually selected Anscombe her, himself to do this work. Uh, and her most indep important independent contribution is her 1957 book, Intention, which attempted to give an account of human action and agency uh, that tried to reconcile the different ways that we could use impending, uh, both in the kind of like a uh, cognitive way of like you mean to do something, but also um, that you hope for something that uh, what my intention or goal, but there's also different ways that we, he was trying to figure out the different ways that we use this idea of intention. Um, the reason why we're reading some of her work today is uh, her work on what she, what was known as analytic Thomism or renewed interest in uh, Thomas Aquinas and theories of natural law from the virtue of rigorous analytic philosophy. Uh, she wrote several decades before McIntyre in modern moral philosophy and makes a similar argument, though it's significantly less well known than McIntyre's after virtue. And we'll talk about the similarities of those arguments in a second. So McIntyre provocatively uh, titles one of his chapters that I had you read, Why the Enlightenment Project of Justifying Morality Had to Fail. And he characterizes the Enlightenment project as that of providing a rational justification for norm moral norms. As he writes on page 52, that despite the differences between Enlightenment philosophers, they all believed in constructing arguments that would move from premises about human nature to conclusions about the authority of moral rules. We can think of Kant trying to ground um, uh, moral laws on practical reason alone, or Rousseau developing a theory of political obligation from the state of nature. Uh, but McIntyre thinks that this project was always bound to fail. Um, not, only, uh, not only has failed in that we don't actually have a justified rational account of morality after several decades, uh, several centuries of enlightenment philosophy, but that there's a fundamental mismatch the way, between what they think of human nature and their account of human obligation as morally binding. So what is that? Um, ethics for Aquinas, or sorry, for, for McIntyre, drawing on Aristotle, presupposes some account, this is a, a, and this is a quote on page 52, presupposes some account of potentiality and act, some account of the essence of man as a rational animal, and above all, some account of the human telos. Um, what this means is that ethical behavior is what allows human beings to realize their true nature. Um, that, that allows them to move from humans as they happen to be, which is not necessarily virtuous, but to a virtuous and full and flourishing human life. Uh, this gets developed in Jewish, Christ, Christian, and Islamic traditions uh, uh, into this idea of natural law. And, and ultimately, the idea of ethics for, for McIntyre, as he writes on page 53, is that to say what someone ought to do is at one and the same time to say what the course of action will, in these circumstances, as a matter of fact, lead towards man's true end, and that is to say what law ordained by God, comprehended by reason, enjoins. Moral sentences are thus used in this framework to make claims which are true or false. So essentially, we can evaluate the truth or falsity of moral statements, uh, like murder is wrong, or, or you have a moral obligation to care for the poor, um, by comparing them to an account of human humanity's purpose, or ultimate goal, as revealed by the divine law. Uh, and this shared idea that human beings have some sort of natural, essential nature and purpose as designed by God uh, is what gives uh, moral statements their meaning, that it allows us to evaluate, oh, is this action actually moral or not? Does this actually play a part in human excellence and uh, realizing human purpose? 
Uh, but the Enlightenment makes a series of critiques against this general framework, uh, against the conception of human nature as uh, tied together in communities and united together to God and the great chain of being, the social contract theories of, of political obligation, conceive of humans as individuals uh, who only form communities through contracts. Uh, we are not naturally part of communities. Uh, against the Platonic and Aristotelian idea that human wisdom and reason points towards the good life for humans, the Enlightenment res uh, has this very limited view of reason, that it is calculative. It evaluates the consequences of action, but it doesn't say which things are moral. Uh, and most importantly, the scientific revolution replaced this teleological conception of nature, that nature has an inherent purpose uh, as an expression of the divine will, with this me mechanistic account of nature. Um, as he writes on page 54, uh, they reject any teleological views of human nature, any view of man as having an essence which defines its true end. In doing so, they undermine the foundations of this conception of human beings as creatures in need of ethical education to realize their true potential, but they seek to maintain the idea that moral claims are true or false. Uh, as he writes on page 60, the habit of speaking of moral judgments as true or false persists, but the question of what it is in virtue of which a particular moral judgment uh, is true or false has come to lack any clear answer. Since the Enlightenment rejects the idea of tradition, of any predefined human nature, instead of favoring principles of autonomy and individualism and equality and religious freedom, there's nothing beyond any individual belief or preference that can be prove or disprove moral statements. Since we've rejected the idea that humans have a unifying natural essence that we're supposed to realize and instead embrace the idea that we're blank slates, free to choose what values and principles we can justify with our own reason. And this is, of course, like kind of a caricature. Um, it's impossible for us to evaluate two competing moral claims since there's no like objective principle that we can appeal to. It's just simply your preference versus my preference. And Ansco makes a similar version of the argument. She argues, uh, and this is on page one of Modern Moral Philosophy, that the concepts, uh, this is the, reca the supplemental reading, the concepts of obligation and duty, moral obligation and moral duty, that is to say, and of what is morally right and wrong, and of the moral sense of ought, ought to be jettisoned if this is psychologically possible, because they are survivals or derivatives from survivals of an earlier conception of ethics which no longer survives and are only harmful without it. So just like McIntyre, Anscombe thinks that we use these moral language of moral obligation and moral duty, um, but we don't have this ethical framework that gives explains what a moral obligation is or why a moral duty is distinct from any other kind of duty. And, and for Anscombe, this idea of moral duty has comes from the idea of a, a divine law, that it's the divine law, the moral law established by God that provides the extra kind of um, binding force of moral obligations, but we've come to reject this uh, idea of the divine law. We don't uh, pretend to in our enlightenment, post-enlightenment liberal pluralist society that we should not ground political and moral obligation based on any particular religious belief, uh, but we still want to say that there are moral obligations. And so for Anscombe, again, um, we end up losing the roots that give meaning to this language of moral obligation. And so McIntyre writes that the Enlightenment is self-character. This is here. He's, this is what the Enlightenment claims, that the self that has been liberated from all these outmoded forms of social organization, which had imprisoned it simultaneously within a belief in a theistic and teleological world order, and within those hierarchical structures which attempted to legitimate themselves as such a part of a world order. This is what McIntyre says that the Enlightenment claims to be doing. And he's interested in what the costs of this liberation are. This is the question that McIntyre is, is ultimately interested in in this book. What have we given up in order to free human beings from these hierarchical structures? Uh, for him, it means that we're condemned to have irresolvable ethical and political disputes that devolve into pure, meaningless emotivism. Uh, like Strauss argued, McIntyre sees Nietzschean nihilism, uh, ethical values are nothing more than the will to power, as the inevitable conclusion of the Enlightenment project. Thus, in a chapter I didn't have you read, he contends that right now we face a choice, uh, Nietzsche or Aristotle. And he writes on page 118 of the book, either one must follow through the aspirations and the collapse of different versions of the Enlightenment project until there remains only the Nietzschean diagnosis and the Nietzschean problematic, uh, that morality has no meaning and that God is dead, or one must hold that the Enlightenment project was not only mistaken, but should never have been commenced in the first place. So after the break, we'll turn to his account of the virtues and what it would mean to choose Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas over Nietzsche. But 
If you need to take a break, this is a great time to pause the video and then we will continue the lecture in just a moment. So McIntyre spends much of the second half of After Virtue exploring a series of ancient traditions and accounts of virtue from Homer, Aristotle, Aquinas, uh, to explore how moral concepts and language is, are rooted in different conception, uh, rooted in these larger conceptions of what the world is, how the world fits together, and how human beings in their ideal form of life fit into the world. Uh, and he, in the chapter where your excerpts pick up, he's interested in the question of like, is there some sort of unifying uh, conception of the virtues, despite these very different conceptions, uh, th these very diverse traditions. Uh, and, he's, and, his, and his answer is that while they fill in this kind of schematic differently, they all have three structural features. Uh, the, that there is a background account of what they call a practice. That means that they understand virtues not as simply moral laws, but as practices. And I'll explain what practices mean in a second. The second, which I've already characterized as a narrative order of a single human life. Uh, this is the idea that there, we can tell a story about a human life with a purpose and a goal and an intention. And the third, um, of what constitutes a moral tradition. And, and this moral tradition is what gives uh, uh, these practices and these narratives of human life uh, meaning and evaluative content. So let's explicate this a little bit in more detail. Uh, practices McIntyre defines are any coherent and complex form of socially established cooperative human activity through which goods internal to that form of activity are realized in, a uh, in the course of trying to achieve these standards of excellence which are appropriate to and partially derivative of that form of activity. What does that mean? Um, it means that practices are activities that are social and which their good is in and of themselves, that you, that you engage in a practice not because of the external goods, the fame, the money, uh, the, 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 the social esteem or what, what have you that you gain from engaging in the practice, uh, but that the act of practicing something is good, right? This is why you practice uh, practicing music, right? That the act of practicing music is, is, is virtuous and good. Um, but this also means uh, that because these types of practices that, that McIntyre is interested in are social, that ethics gets its meaning from its role in community values and relationships. Um, so we can evaluate practices uh, based on how well they are submitted, how well the behavior is submitted to the, the community standards of excellence and, and, and obedience to rules. So you have to submit to the norms of the community in the practice of a practice uh, rather than your own individual uh, preferences. You can think of the practice here, like the idea of like a religious discipline uh, in, which, or in which you are in kind of disciplining yourself according to some standards that are not simply your own free will in order to achieve some good. Um, but for him, practices and traditions are also intergenerational relationships. Uh, he says, he writes on page 194, the achievement and a fortiori the authority of a tradition which I then confront and from which I have to learn. Um, that these are, that practices have meaning because they are intergenerational, because they are not made up in the present. Uh, here you can think of forms of religious worship that date back centuries in which you enter into a practice based on the traditions of the past, uh, not what you want to do now. And so McIntyre thinks that if we think of the virtues as practices, that the authority of the virtues comes from their intergenerational nature. Uh, this is an alien idea, as he notes on page 202, to the modern self. Um, but, to, so, but here, the idea is that to become virtuous is not, to, uh, is not to achieve autonomy, to give ourselves meaning, but to submit ourselves to a practice that predates and will outlast us. But while McIntyre notes that all virtues are practices, not all practices are virtuous. And what's missing here is the idea of a telos, or the purpose of human beings, which is not merely survival, but living a good and flourishing life. As he writes on page 219, the good life of man is a spent seeking for the good life for man, and the virtues necessary for the seeking are those which will enable us to understand what more and, and what else the good life for man is. This is a quest for a meaningful life, that this is what we are all as human beings called to for McIntyre. But this is not some sort of solitary existentialist quest, nor is it the emergence of autonomous individuals as it is for the Enlightenment. 
this is a quest that always takes place with others and always that takes place in a community. Uh, we are born into communities that help give our lives meanings. Uh, and we are, and part of living the good life is navigating and contributing to those relationships. Uh, as he writes on 221, the story of my life is always embedded in the story of those communities from which I derive my identity. I am born with a past and try, and to try to cut myself off from that past in the individualistic mode is to deform my present relationships. And so um, he continues on, on later on this page that insofar as the virtues sustain the relationships required for practices, they have to sustain relationships to the past and to the future as well as in the present. But the, the traditions through which the pr particular practices are transmitted and reshaped never exist in isolation for a larger social tradition. So like Burke, McIntyre grounds his account of the good life in intergenerational terms. We're not isolated individuals, but part of communities that predate and outlast us, and which, to whom we have unique obligation. Like Strauss, uh, he thinks that there's a real danger in trying to cut ourselves off from these traditions, uh, because these traditions provide anchors to our moral, political discourse and actions. They help us give meaning to our life story so that our life isn't just some random thing that's happening. And ultimately, um, it is the from these traditions that give our conceptions of the good life meaning, even though we can never choose these traditions that we're born into. Again, this kind of recurring trope from Burke. Um, the attempt to free ourselves from tradition will always result in the nihilism that McIntyre critiques at the beginning of the book. And he says on 225, unsurprisingly, it is the lack of any such unifying conception of the human life which underlies modern denials of the factual character of moral judgments and more especially of those judgments which ascribe virtues or vices to individuals. So he, he looks around at the world and looks at the fact that we don't, he thinks, use moral language appropriately, that we're unwilling to kind of condemn or praise uh, moral behavior. Um, and he says that's because we're too afraid, we're unwilling to kind of make definitive value judgments on what the proper way to live a moral and human life is. And that's because we want, we try to free people from the superstitions of traditions and the arbitrary hierarchies of traditions, but in doing so, we've lost the ability to fit our lives into a bigger meaningful story, that, that our lives are more than just a series of arbitrary decisions and actions. Uh, and he thinks that this is a necessary, not just a pragmatic argument, but this is a positive good of traditional accounts because they are the only way that we can transform our lives and to give our lives narrative uh, coherency. So much of this argument so far is admittedly dense philosophical argument about moral psychology, language, and morality. Uh, but since this is a class on political thought, what are some of these political implications? Uh, McIntyre spends much of chapter 17 in, um, that I had you read, uh, discussing debates over the meaning of justice and rival forms of liberalism in American political philosophy, such as Rawls for distributive justice as fairness and Nozick's libertarian conception of justice based on individual acquisition and property rights. Uh, the point isn't the specifics of that debate, but the conclusion that McIntyre draws on page 252, uh, that our society cannot hope to achieve moral consensus. Because liberalism rejects making any value judgments on different conceptions of the good life, it follows that liberalism itself can't settle these debates about the nature of justice or about any of the intractical debates that make up the politics of our culture war. They stem from different premises about the ends of human life. And since we are unwilling to evaluate these premises, we are unable to reach any sort of moral consensus. Think about debates about abortion is a, an example. They stem from two different premises about the, right, the, uh, the question of reproductive autonomy uh, for people who can become pregnant on the one hand and a, and a claim about the, uh, this, the dignity of the fetus as a human life. These are irreconcilable premises. Uh, you're not going to be able to convince one person to the other based on these premises, right? Thus, McIntyre agrees from Marx for non-Marxist reasons that conflict and not consensus, um, sorry, conflict and not consensus are at the heart of the modern social structure. It is and not just that we live through too much of a variety and multiplicity of fragmented concepts. It is that these are used at one and the same time to express rival and incompatible social ideas and policies and to furnish us with a pluralist political rhetoric whose function is to conceal the depth of our conflict that we simply are doomed to this conflict and we are unwilling to recognize it because we're so committed to this value pluralism of liberalism. McIntyre's anti-modernism is thoroughgoing, however, as he concludes the chapter, modern systematic politics, whether liberal, conservative, radical, or socialist, simply has to be rejected from a standpoint that owes genuine allegiance to the tradition of virtues. 
for modern politics itself expresses its institutional forms as systematic rejection of that tradition. McIntyre here is not just rejecting liberal pluralism, but he also thinks that market, market economies are too individualistic and destructive of traditions, communities, and values. But he also th writes that Marxism is an exhausted political tradition. And in the preface to the third edition of After Virtue, he, he rejects the label that many critics have given him as conservative, contending that the conservative moralist is just the mirror of the liberal pluralist and is, quote, one more stock character in the scripted conversations of the ruling elite's advanced modernity. So he's critical of both modern systems of power that alienate individuals from each other, but he also believes that such systems of power are inevitable given our rejection of the tradition of natural law and virtue. So on the one hand, he's like progressive in what some respects that he thinks that that, 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 that institutionalized power alienates us from each other uh, and he wants to kind of liberate us from this alienation, but he wants to do so um, by returning to this conception of a rich shared tradition. Uh, and the, the last sentence of the book gives us a clue of what the alternative might be. He says, what matters at this stage is the construction of local forms of community within which civility and intellectual and moral life can be sustained mm -hmm. through the new dark ages, uh, which we now already upon us. This time, however, the barbarians are not waiting at the gates, but they are already been governing us for quite some time. And it is our lack of consciousness of this fact that constitutes part of our predicament. We are waiting not for Godot, but for another doubtless very different Saint Benedict. He thus imagines the creation of communities of practice inspired by their own shared traditions and accounts of the good life. Um, how this would work is completely undefined in After Virtue. Uh, Rod Dreher tried to take this idea in his book, The Benedict Option, which calls for conservative Christians to more or less opt out of the modern world and form monk-like communities organized around a new version of the rule of Saint Benedict. Uh, maybe it's something like getting rid of pluralist nations like the United States uh, uh, and, and exchanging them for culturally homogenous smaller communities of shared values. What's clear is that it's some sort of alternative to liberalism, capitalism, and modernity as a whole. And he hasn't really given us like what that political politics would look like. And so another way that we can think of the political obligations is to think of Anscombe's uh, uh, Contraception and Chastity, this essay that I had you all read. And I'm less interested about the specific arguments against contraception or the bizarre argument about intentionality that justifies why the rhythm method of birth control is moral, but hormonal birth control is not. Uh, but I, I'm more interested in the types of rhetoric and argument and conclusions that this account of tradition, virtue, natural law generates. So kind of using McIntyre's language, we can think of marriage as a practice and chastity as a virtue. Anscombe's argument requires rethinking marriage and sexuality in the context of virtues, practices, and traditions. Chastity is the appropriate virtue of sexual behavior and cultivating that virtue requires shifting away from thinking of sexuality in terms of individuals relating to individuals and relationships of, of consent and equality and more in the context of traditions and teleology. So that means that to be virtuous in our marriage, we need to submit to Christian sexual teaching. Uh, this tradition gives a sense of unity to our actions and behavior and provides a broader narrative that, that gives meaning to our life that are, and specifically to our uh, marriages, uh, that they are not simply just contracts for the use of each other's bodies, which is literally how Immanuel Kant described marriage. Um, it also involved a teleological account of marriage and sexual union, that procreation is the purpose of the sexual act, uh, and the, the argument against contraception is that it is the corruption of that purpose that creates the sin. And so she describes marriage as the mutual commitment in which each side ceases to be autonomous in various ways and also sexually. The sexual liberty and agreement together is great here, here so long as they are not immoderate so as to become slaves of sensuality. Nothing is shameful. If the complete act is the ones involving the ejaculation of the man's seed that they engage in and are true and real marriage acts. Um, and so we get this sense that we've like reviewed marriage um, into this practice, into this tradition, into this virtue that is not about individualism. Uh, and she further kind of makes the argument, uh, she concludes the essay with this claim that the teaching which I have rehearsed is indeed against the grain of the world, against the current of our time, but that after all is what the church as teacher is for. The truths that are acceptable to a time, these will be proclaimed not only by the church, the church teaches also those truths that are hateful to the spirit of the age. So, so like McIntyre, she thinks that like modernity has more or less uh, corrupted our ability to use moral language and to have meaningful, in this case, marital relationships 
um, that are virtuous um, and, and, and that we need to recover the sense of traditional virtue. Um, so why do we care about this relatively obscure argument about chastity that was written in the context of the uh, 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 sexual revolution of the 60s? Um, it points to a type of political argument that this approach to thinking about virtue and natural law can produce. It's not about giving reasons that are acceptable to everyone, regardless of your uh, background commitments, but making arguments that appeal to those within the same tradition. It's deeply anti-liberal in this respect, but also in respect to the rejection of individual privacy and choice. Sexual ethics is not about individuals respecting the consent and autonomy of other individuals with whom they have sexual relationships with, uh, but about the submission of both individuals to this tradition and to this natural law of sex that governs sexuality. Uh, and this would hold for other forms, parts of our lives as well. A politics grounded on this form of thinking would not be one about individual rights, the social contract or accountable government necessarily, but about submission to the community and self-discipline in accordance with community norms and standards. So some questions to consider as you finish the reading and before we have class uh, this week, are you persuaded by the kind of diagnostic uh, argument that McIntyre and Enscope make that the effect of modernity has had on our ability to make moral and political claims? Uh, do you think it's possible to recover communities of shared practices and traditions in the modern world, whether they are these the specific traditions that the, uh, the, the, the Catholic traditions that both McIntyre and Enscope favor or other forms of communities of shared practice? What would such communities look like? How would their politics function? How would they relate to others? Um, and are there alternatives to the nihilism of modernity in which we're unable to reconcile moral and political arguments uh, or give meaning to our lives that are distinct from this form of communitarianism? So that's uh, the it for today's lecture on McIntyre and Scombe and virtue ethics. This wraps up our discussion of conservatism as traditionalism. Um, and I look forward to discussing these texts with you in class this week in the discussion sections. So I'll see you then, take care.